Hi, Julia Asher, Recipes for a Sweet Life. I have a fun 3D cookie. It's a spin on the pots of gold and Halloween cookie cauldron that I did recently. We're using many of the same pieces, just in slightly different ways. So let's uh, get started talking about it. This is an excellent project, I think, for Mother's Day or for a tea party or for a spring garden party, something of that sort. I'm a big fan of vintage cups and saucers like these. So as we go about decorating this set, I'm gonna be trying to pick up motifs of brown transfer wear and a little bit of the gilding that you see on some of these antique cups that are part of my collection. So while these look very ornate, it's actually a pretty straightforward project in terms of number of cookies required. There are only three for the cup itself, a hemisphere dome, which is about three inches in diameter, and I'll have all the exact dimensions in the video description, a little ring that's about the same size that rather than fitting this way as it did for the pots of gold and cauldron, we're gonna be flipping it upside down and creating more of a teacup shape out of it. And then we've got a small little handle that I've cut from two different cookie cutters. For the saucer, it's a simple one piece, but it does have a lovely embossed center, and I'm gonna show you how to create that in the next step. So I'm gonna start backwards and talk about the saucer and show you how that's shaped. The thing that's novel about it is simply the embossed center and also the size of the cookie. It's about five inches across and I don't have a cutter that big. So when that happens, I get creative and I'm gonna improvise by using a bowl, a standard kitchen bowl as a template and we're gonna cut around that. This is one of those cookies I like to roll and cut directly on my silicone mat so I don't have to transfer it. It's very large. And so if you have to transfer it off the silicone mat onto the baking sheet, it's likely to distort and we want to keep it perfectly round. So simply going to place it on top, not push down too hard, and use a sharp bladed paring knife that's clean to slice around the edge. And I find that small up and down motions tends to give the cleanest cut of the dough as opposed to a big broad stroke. That can leave a more jagged edge, believe it or not. We'll see what happens here. Then without lifting the bowl, I'm removing the excess dough. And I like to just run my paring knife along around the edge just to pack in any roughness. This is just to smooth out any rough cuts. So I'm basically pressing the dough in against the side of the bowl. And then we'll lift it. And that looks pretty nice. There's a slight depression here where the the bowl was weighing down on the dough, but that's gonna be hidden once we ice it, so I'm not too worried about it, but I am gonna press in more of these jagged edges here so that it's not as rough once it's baked. I think that looks good. And then in the center is going to go an embossed piece, and I need to make room for it, so I just wanna center this ring on top of it. This is about two and seven eighths inch, I believe. I think that's roughly centered. It's good to look at it from all directions to make sure it is. We're going to pull out this middle piece that we can reserve for rolling something else. I want to just put my cutter back in and make this slightly bigger than I cut it by just jostling it around a little bit. And you'll see why that's important. I'm going to be nesting an embossed piece in there later and I need to make a little room for that. I'm just going to set that aside and we're going to get another mat to do the embossed piece. And for that, I'm not using a conventional silicone mold. Instead, I'm using a sugar veil mat. This is something that's used to make edible cake lace. But I found that it also embosses cookie dough really, really nicely. Start by flattening it out so it covers that area. And then I'm just going to take my rolling pin and really press it in there and get it nice and flat. Now, you'll see the beauty of these silicone mats is, and let's make sure this is really flowered so I can lift it, is that they peel off very easily without that silicone, without the blue mat being floured itself. And I'm just going to cut out the portion I want and we'll cut around it. So this is a great way to merge different shapes and textures into one cookie. You could just do this as a single cookie and it'd be quite pretty. Now there's a little bit of gap here, but as it bakes, it'll spread a little bit and the two will fuse together and you end up with a piece that looks just like that. Bake at 375 for my normal baking temperature and that'll be all set and ready to go, cooled down, and you'll be ready to ice it. Okay, so let's talk about the handle piece next because that too is done in a creative way with different cutters. Again, start by rolling this about an eighth of an inch thick. I want it pretty delicate so it doesn't look massive once it's on my teacup. So I start by cutting 
with my teapot cutter, I just want to capture the handle part of it. I'm not going to need any of that, so we're going to cut that off. And then I'm going to come in with my teacup handle, which is slightly smaller, but use the back side of it and cut in on that to create kind of a handle shape. And that looks pretty nice, but it's a little open. I want a little more curve to it, so I'm just going to tuck it around a little bit. And that'll be ready for baking. And again, I would just progress across the whole sheet and do a whole, whole mat of them and then bake those at my normal baking temperature, probably a little less than 10 minutes because they're very small, thin pieces. The last piece or pieces I want to show you are how to make these domes. I'm using my handy silicone spheres to shape them, but I am elevating one of them, actually probably both of them, so that they don't slide completely down to the bottom, especially the ring. You want to make sure that it, it stays off the, the bottom edge or you'll get a lip or a foot, if you will on the dough, and we don't want that. And you want the surface well floured again, because I do have to lift this up and onto the mold here. And I want to do that with minimal distortion. So you can see my surface was pretty well floured. And so for the dome piece, I simply center it over it, and then just work it down. Gently work out those pleats, because you don't want them in your cup. You want a nice smooth cup. We're going to be dipping this later. So the smoother it is, the better your dipping will be. To make these ring pieces, I simply come in with a smaller cutter. I believe this one is two, and the same one I used on the plate, two and seven eighths inch across. And I'm just gonna use it to score a ring on top. And again, you wanna have this as centered as possible on the dome. So I'm kind of looking at it both side to side and also front to back to make sure I'm cutting or scoring an even ring. I'm just gonna gently Press in to score the circle. I don't want to cut all the way through. If I cut all the way through in the baking process, this will slide down and your ring will end up smushed on the bottom of the hemispheres. This way, by scoring it, I've cut into it enough so that when it comes out of the oven, warm from the oven, I'll take my paring knife and just cut through it completely and then pop off this inner piece and then lift off this ring. So now we want to talk about how we're going to get color on some of these cookie pieces. These are going to be my handles, something like this. These were first piped and then sprayed. I've got a number 25 tip here and a fairly thick icing that's going to allow me to get some nice little spiral, spirals and other shapes on these handles. Let me just clean that tip a little bit and I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to do a little rotation at the top to create a spiral very close to the top. I'm not applying much pressure because I don't want this to be very bulky. And then just bringing it around. And then I'm going to do sort of a small shell border down through the bottom. So pushing forward to create a bead and then pulling back is the motion. Pushing forward, pull back. Push forward, pull back. I've got to hold on to this little piece because it's so small it likes to move. I could have it on a non-skid surface. That would also help. And that looks lovely. I've done slightly different patterns on these. Now I'm going to move on to dipping. So I have a whole other video that also talks about dipping contoured pieces, and I'll refer you off to that for a lot of detail. Here I'm going to work through it pretty quickly just so you see the basics of it. So we're ready to dip. My goal is to take a piece that looks like this to something that looks like this, more coated with white. This is a really irregular piece, and so do expect some irregularity to the dipping. This is about as smooth as I can dip it. We are going to be covering it with a, a little bit, partially with some fondant pieces, some stamp fondant pieces later. So some small amount of irregularity isn't the end of the world. That's our goal. And to do that, I work with icing of dipping consistency. It flows gradually off the spoon. You don't want it too runny or it will completely flow off the cookie. So I typically add about two tablespoons of water to my thick royal icing glue. So it's got some body to it. And for this piece, Again, I've got my molds elevated so that this doesn't slide all the way to the bottom and create a foot. So I've got actually three stacked together for these pieces because otherwise they slide down to here and then I can't clean up the bottom edges. So for this piece here, I like to do a rotating motion. I feel I get the cleanest dip this way as opposed to plunging it head first in. 
I'm kind of touching it from the side so I don't muck up too much of the part that I've dipped. We want to make sure you get that all the way around. This is kind of a messy process. I've got a fingerprint there. I'm going to just submerge it one more time. And then shake, 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 typically from the bottom. That upper edge is a little rough, but that's okay. We're going to be covering that with a little bit of chocolate dough later. But that looks pretty good to me, so I'm going to set it on my mold. You'll see it slips down pretty far, even with three on top but not all the way to the bottom. Before that icing sets, I want to come in with my paring knife and just clean up the bottom edge. That'll just lead, leave to less of a foot or less, a, less roughness at the bottom. So this is a little different than what I did in my other videos where I dip both pieces the same color. I am doing a two-tone effect here, which I think will be pretty cool. So I'm going to move over to this nice plum color to dip the, the full dome. And again, this is a similar consistency as what I had before. Just going to bring in a gentle stir because I don't want to kick too much air into it. But in this case, I like to plunge head first. I might remove the spoon to give me more access there. I feel I get the best, cleanest dips if I just plunge it all the way down. And you certainly need a bowl deep enough, small enough, and deep enough so that you don't hit the bottom of the bowl when you do this. Otherwise, you'll have kind of a dent in the icing when you pull it out. And I just pull it to the side, and it's generally pretty smooth. You'll generally see, though, some bubbles to start, more so in this process than if you were to outline in flood, so I like to get those immediately. Sometimes they'll just work themselves out as the icing flows off the sides, but sometimes not, so I do try to get the ones that are especially far up on the back, and that looks pretty good. Again, I think I could go a little thicker on this icing. It's draining a little more quickly than it possibly needs to, but I think it'll be fine. Set it on my mount, and again, same cleaning process with the paring knife or with the side of my trussing needle. This tool also works well. Just clean up that bottom edge a few times before the icing sets so you have less to file once the icing does set. Okay, I think that's clean enough to set aside. My hands certainly aren't, so I'm gonna go ahead and wash those. We're gonna put those aside to dry. I ideally let these dry overnight so that I can handle them so the icing is completely hard. So I've got a few pieces to spray gold. I want to work in some of the gold accents that I have on my vintage teacups. And a great way to do that is with edible luster spray. PME brand is particularly good because it dries really quickly and doesn't pool up very much. I've got a spray guard up, a little backdrop, and also have covered my work surface with paper towels so these don't slide as much and so I don't make a whole mess of my kitchen. Now this is the top of the cup and this top edge has been filed and it's going to be what reveals on top and you can see it's kind of a mixture of icing and cookie right now and I want to, I want to make it mostly gold. I also want to coat the interior of the cup gold because that will reveal in the final project but I don't want the white to get gold so what I'm going to do is just wrap some frosting sheets, some plastic would do as well, around these pretty tight to create a collar to protect the sides from getting sprayed. We're gonna do this one first. You wanna make sure it's pretty taut though, otherwise some of the gold color can sneak under. I'm gonna concentrate my spraying on the inside of it mostly, though, because I am also gonna be covering the top lip with modeling chocolate, so it's not too important that that be evenly coated gold. It's more important that I get the inside. I might even bend this over a little bit so that I'm sure not to get the sides of the cup because that would be kind of disastrous. Then we'll come back and spray my handles and the saucer. Give it a good shake. Hold it at a distance. Again, just concentrating mostly on the inside. Got to get it from this side as well. You can also rotate the piece. That gives you better visibility. And I'm not going to do much more on the edge because I don't want to get the white gold. Let's see what that looks like. I think that looks pretty good. So I'm going to move that off to the side because we're going to be doing additional work on that later. And then just quickly spray these remaining pieces. My icing here is completely dried so that I don't swish it and so that the color stays more fast and doesn't absorb into the icing. 
want to get both sides of the handle. So that's the other reason to have the icing dry, so you don't smush it when you flip it over. So you'll notice I actually have what seems to be tea in my teacups in the top that just meets that gold area on the upper brim. And that is actually isomalt, which is a form of sugar that is less prone to wilting and less prone to clouding than actual real sugar. So we're gonna work with it. So if you wanna use these on display for a long period of time, if not eating them immediately, then isomalt is the way to go. Isomalt comes in sort of this not, I wouldn't say it's a powdered form. They're little small granules. You can get it in different forms. I'm working with this form here. And we I've got two cups in this pan. We're going to add a half a cup. I'm going to bring it to about 280 degrees Fahrenheit. So you do need a candy thermometer for this process. At that point, I can add my color. And I'm just going to add probably about two drops of my Chef Master liquid gel food coloring and about one drop of Buckeye Brown. And that's going to make a nice tea color similar to that. Then continue to take it up to 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, at that stage, when it's poured, it will set very firm and candy-like. If you don't take it to quite that temperature, it can be soft and will ultimately wilt. This piece is suspended in the middle of the cup, and so you don't want it so soft that it actually sags and wilts. You want it to stay very, very flat. So it's critical to use the candy thermometer for this. Uh, once it's out, we're going to be pouring it into the center of the ring that I just sprayed. So I've got that on a silicone lined mat so that once the candy sets, it'll easily pop off. We'll come back to that. You could use parchment as well, but parchment tends to buckle, particularly when you pour hot syrup on it. So you'll get a more wavy looking tea if you use parchment paper. So I'll set that aside. I'm just going to add water to this and get it started, and then we'll put it on the stove. Just adding enough water to make a sludge. Basically, you don't have to have a lot. It will liquefy when it gets on the stove. It was half a cup to two cups of the isomalt. Just want to get it started here so it's all hydrated before we start heating it. And I'll start it on about medium to medium high and then jack up the temperature as it's more dissolved. If you have any crystallized, still crystallized isomalt on the sides of the pan at this stage, you can try rinsing them down, but it's best to try to keep them out of the syrup because you don't want that pouring into your final product. Otherwise, it looks clear except for those pieces there, so I'm going to try to avoid them. So we're at about 280 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's, why they, that's when they say you can add color. I'm not sure why that temperature is so critical for color addition, but we're going to Go with what they say, and I just want to put in a couple of drops of yellow, I believe. Start with one first and one of brown and see what kind of color that makes. I want it to be kind of tea-like. And I am going to have to give it a little stir for this. I think it's a little too brown, so we're going to add another drop of yellow. That might not be bad. We'll tighten it up a little bit. And now we want it to go till three, give another stir to get that yellow distributed. I think that's a nice rich tea color. Definitely not a light tea, but a, a dark blend. Looks a little darker than the pan and it actually will too, I think when it gets poured. And we're just gonna let this go to 320 and then we'll let the bubbles subside before we pour it because if you pour it with all the bubbles, the bubbles will actually set and we don't want a bubbly tea. So it's up to 320. It starts moving very quickly temperature-wise towards the end. And as you can see, there's still a lot of bubbles in there. So I want to let this just sit until all the bubbles subside. You don't want to let it sit too long because it'll start to set and we need to pour it while it's fluid. But I, if I pour it with all those bubbles, the bubbles will end up in the tea, as I said earlier. So most of the bubbles have subsided. I just need a very thin layer in the bottom. And you can see how much lighter it looks here. Still got a few bubbles in there. I just want to make sure it comes all the way to the edge of the teacup. Let me pour a little bit more in. And that looks good. We're going to set that aside, though, to completely set up. This sets rather quickly. It could be a matter of a couple of minutes.
Okay, so I've set this about five minutes only and I'll occasionally test it to make sure it removes from the map, but if, if, as long as you can peel it off, as you can see, it's fully set. It does pick up some texture from my mat. My mat has some texture. So if you don't want that texture, you can do it on parchment paper. But as I said before, that parchment paper will buckle when you pour the sugar syrup on it. So you get more of a wave. That's completely flat, which I kind of like. So now the next step I want to do before I put it on my base here is just trim out the top. There's still a lot of unevenness and uneven spraying. So I cut a little band, a little ring, I should say, of chocolate dough. This is my modeling chocolate, and I have a whole other video about how to make that. Just rolled this through my pasta machine to the number three or number four setting and used two cookie cutters to cut out the ring. And I'm, I think that's just gonna trim off the top a little bit more neatly. So to adhere that, I just use a little bit of corn syrup and I wanna make sure not to get this on that lovely clear tea that I just made. So be careful not to drip it. Just keep corn syrup off the top of the ring if you can. It's a, my ring's a little small for the teacup top, so I, but the chocolate, the good thing about chocolate dough is it does stretch. So I'm gonna just stretching it out to the edge, com completely to the edge as much as I can. Looking at it from the top to make sure it's a nice fit. Okay, now we're ready to mount it onto my purple base. I again have actually filed these pieces down for good fit before I start sticking them together. And I do that with my microplaner. You'll see that it's nicely filed at the top. So I know I'm gonna have a nice tight fit. And then I have a front marked here with edible marker and I'm gonna line that up with the front. I'm nesting it in a little trivet. It's just a silicone trivet that I cut back. So it just fits there nice and perfectly. So it won't rotate as I'm doing this part. I like to do the piecing of this cup together off the saucer so I don't mess up the saucer. The saucer still needs to be decorated. So we're going to do this piece first and then come back to the saucer. My front was marked here. It's hard, hard to see now with the T. Now you'll notice that there is not, there's a little bit of a gap between the bottom and the top. It's not quite seamless here, but we can clean that up and we're going to kind of disguise that because I'm going to be laying some fondant pieces, stamped fondant pieces all the way around to create that upper trim. And now we're ready to put those little fondant pieces on. I've pre-cut some. I'm going to show you how to stamp a couple, and then I'm just going to put them all around the top. So this is very similar to what I did with the stamping in my recent quiver video, where I rolled out fondant in the number three setting on my pasta machine, which is about a sixteenth of an inch thick, and then stamped it with food coloring and created some really pretty patterns very quickly that way. You could of course hand paint this. You could decorate this cup in myriad ways. You could hand paint it if you're an excellent hand painter. That would be one way to go. But stamping is a great way to add a lot of lavish detail really quickly. So to do that, I've rolled my fondant nice and thin. I'm going to re-ink this foam pad. This came without any food coloring on it originally. I'm just applying my normal liquid gel food coloring to get it moist, spreading it around and blotting off any excess. And then I just want to select out a portion of a stamp. I'm using a large self-adhesive stamp and I'm just going to select out the inner portion to create these little scallops. But I, So I'll end up with a lot of stamped fondant that I won't be using on the piece, but we can ball that up, re-knead it, and it'll turn into brown and we can use it for another project. Just stamping the piece, that looks pretty good. I'm just gonna stamp a bunch of them because I'll need a few of them. I need about 12. So to create these, I'm just gonna take my small cutter. This is about 7 eighths of an inch. Just center it on that little piece we like. Cut out a bunch, and these are gonna get cut in half to form the scallops. I'm gonna cut them all in the same direction. So I've got two little loops at the top of each half circle. So it's completely symmetric when it's applied. My food coloring here is still a little damp. I can see it glistening. So I just want to be careful about handling the faces of these too soon. So I'm going to try working with some of the older ones I cut earlier and hope that they conform nicely to the cup and then come back to these that are a little bit more moist. 
So I'm just applying a little bit of corn syrup to the back of the piece, ideally with a clean brush. And tucking it in to fill in this gap here. These little pieces are going to work fine, I think. And I'm going to work front and then one side part way around and the other side part the way around so that if they don't meet perfectly in the back, that there, there will be a seam in the back as opposed to it being somewhere towards the front of the cup. So I typically work side to side on things like this. Again, at this point, I would stand up and just make sure it's looking good. So the next step is to hide this seam even further by putting up a brown band, and then we're going to come in in detail with some dot work. Okay, so I have cut a modeling chocolate band. It's the same material I used to cut the little disc on top, and that's just going to conceal that central seam all that much more. I find that's easiest to put up onto the cookie when it's on its side and to gradually work it around. And again, we're going to do that with just a touch of corn syrup. I am going to apply it to the band. Not to all the band at once, just from the center, and then we'll work it around the sides. I just want to get it as straight as possible. Now, at this point, you do need to pick it up and kind of work it around to the back until you get it, get the back piece completely secured. Just cutting my back seam. Okay. Now, my band is a little irregular at this point, so I do want to elevate this and just while the dough is and the corn syrup are still drying, still not completely secure, I can kind of get it in good position with my paring knife. Just straighten out any low parts. Like, for instance, this is low here, so I'm pushing it up slightly. But I think that looks pretty good. On to detail work, because God is in the details. I'm going to add little brown dots around the scallops. As I said, I just think that trims them out. And I'm working with my icing of beadwork consistency. Relatively loose, about two to three tablespoons of water for every cup of my icing glue. And it forms a nice rounded dot on its own. And I'm just squeezing ever so lightly. Got this highly elevated so it's, a, it's at eye level. So that's the best way to ensure that the dots look round when you're piping on the side of something. And the last thing I want to do is trim out with bigger white dots right along the bottom and just above the band just to fill in some of the some of the distance that that band creates, some of the little ledge that that band creates. We're going to fill in with dots, and I think that'll help disguise it. So I've got an ivory color. It's the same color we dipped the upper part of the cup in. I think that looks pretty good, and I'm going to now just do a, an underlayer right underneath the band as well. And for this, I'd like to start in the back so that I don't have a seam in the front where they join. Okay, and that we're going to set that aside to dry. We're going to just do some stamping on the saucer and then put it all together. Okay, so now we're on to making the saucer. I have since iced and top coated it, let it dry, and I want to create this kind of transferware-like pattern on top, and I'm going to do that by stamping. You could, of course, paint too, or additionally pipe on it, but I like the low relief of the stamp and the uniformity of the stamp. I wanted a really regular pattern, evenly spaced, and I thought I'd have more control if I were stamping as opposed to painting. So I've got some cool stamps that are going to allow us to do that. I've also created a template here on paper so that, that fits my cookie so that when I place it here, I know exactly where to anchor my stamps. 
So I'm just gonna start with my big kind of honeycomb stamp and put one at each of those lines. So we'll, that'll ensure that it's more or less perfectly symmetrical. And then we'll add in the other details around it. These are all self-adhesive stamps that I'm working now with now, and they're on an acrylic block, which is cool because it allows me to really locate them very precisely. Pressing harder than you might think to make sure I make good contact everywhere on the stamp. That looks, on the cookie rather. That looks good. And we'll just rotate that. And now I'm just gonna show you how I complete one of the patterns. We, we do this, of course, all the way around. Now I've got this nice little leafy effect that I'm gonna use in two directions on either side of the honeycomb. Just joining the stem. This is why I love these acetate stamps because I can see exactly where I placed it. And I'm gonna do that on the other side as well. And I would complete that all the way around before taking the stamp off. But to complete this little pattern, I'm putting on a third stamp, which is a little leaf. And that's just gonna fill in those gaps where the honeycomb meets the longer branch. Now, if you happen to not get a perfect stamp, I was really lucky in this case, you can always come in with a fine line edible marker and fill in. Like for instance, this isn't quite as dark as some of the others, so I could draw over it if I wanted to. It's not quite the same color. You can also add little flourishes. I added on this particular plate here, you'll see I have little dots at the top of the honeycomb and in between the patterns. Those I all did with this fine edible marker as well, just to add a touch more interest. So that's the process of stamping and completing a plate. We're gonna move forward now to getting this cup together because I've got one that's already completely dry and it's also been trimmed out with a little beadwork on the edges to match the beadwork on the cup. Okay, now this I've allowed, or you should ideally allow this to completely dry because we are gonna be handling this to mount it and I don't wanna smudge any of my dots. Mine might still be a little bit wet, so I'm gonna be extra careful. To mount on, same, similarly here, these dots should be completely dry. Now I'm gonna mount it and I like to nestle it into a bit of fondant rather than gluing it directly to the cup. That gives it a little bit of lift, but it also gives it a little nesting spot. So it's less likely to topple around as I mount it. And I've got thick royal icing glue. I'm using white here so that if any peeks out, actually we'll take a little bit off. It doesn't always stick to the, to the uh, spray so well. So sometimes you have to put a little bit down and take it off, which is what I did. Just get that little fondant nesting place ready and a little bit of white glue so that if I do have to move the cup around, it's easy to clean off the bottom of the cup, easier certainly than another color. And my fa front face is facing me right now. I am gonna try to look at this from all directions and make sure it's relatively centered side to side and also front to back before I anchor it. And I think it's okay. So I'm gonna press down on it ever so gently. And you can see the fondant gives it just enough space that it doesn't really, it's not so visible and you don't really need to prop it, but you would need to allow probably an hour's worth of drying time before you really wanna pick it up and move it around because it can flop over. I think that looks pretty good. We're gonna move forward though and put on a handle. I have a number of options, those ones I sprayed earlier that are really gold, but there's not as much gold exposed on this cup as there is on the one that I sprayed gold. So I think I'm going to resort to a simple one that I'd iced earlier in purple so that it matches. And I'm gonna anchor it right about here where there's a big gap. And to do this, I'm just gonna use a little white glue at the top and hopefully that'll be enough to anchor it. Otherwise I might need to re-anchor it with a little white glue and a little gold glue at the bottom. I try to match the color of the glue to what it is I'm gluing it to. Purple glue at the bottom would also be good too because it's going on a purple cup. I think that looks pretty good. The other thing you wanna make sure is that it's straight from the side. And if there's any propensity for it to slip down, you can slide a little bit of paper towel underneath to keep that prop, but mine is staying there, so I think that's just fine. 
Okay, so here you have the finished cookie teacup, and it's barely distinguishable from these real vintage teacups in my collection. I've picked up elements of the transfer wear by stamping on the saucer and also on fondant on the upper edge of the cup, and also gilded accents by spraying with gold luster spray. But of course, you can choose to decorate these any way you want. You could hand paint them, you could stencil them as I stenciled the one up top. You can really get fun and creative with them. They're perfect for weddings, they're perfect for Mother's Day, they're perfect for tea parties, just a whole range of occasions. So get creative with this project, and until the next one, live sweetly.